It's time for Supply Chain Now Radio, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Supply Chain Now Radio spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hello, everybody. Scott Luton here uh, with you at Supply Chain Now Radio. Welcome back to the show. On today's show, though, we aren't broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia, but rather we're broadcasting live from Austin, Texas, home of EFT's Logistics CIO Forum, a Reuters event, where we, we are interviewing some of the most innovative thought leaders that are doing big things across the end-to-end supply chain industry, the influencers. Uh, our Supply Chain Radio team is proud to continue to partner with Nick, Asif, and the EFT and Reuters event team uh, here in Austin. So let's welcome in my fearless co-host here today, Greg White, serial supply chain tech entrepreneur, chronic disruptor, and trusted advisor. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing great. Considering some of the companies that I advise, chronic is more appropriate than you might imagine. <laughs> <laughs> the cannabis industry is hot. It, it? is very hot. Smoking. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but Greg, we got a great uh, repeat guest here today. You know, we were we we covered the EFT uh, 3PL Logistics Summit in Atlanta, the supply chain city, back in June, and one of our most highly rated episodes yeah. uh, featured our guest here today. And we're great. Uh, it's great to have him back, Lee Klaskow, senior. Analyst Transportation and Logistics at Bloomberg Intelligence. Lee, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Doing fantastic. Good. Great to have you back. Good to be here. Um, so we're going to dive into a couple different things here today. Um, but let's start. You know, you know our listeners, we, we get feedback all the time. Our listeners really appreciate the ability to kind of get a sense of who they're hearing from, kind of the background, the backstory. You know, uh, page three and four, as Paul Harvey might might sometimes put it. So, Lee, tell us more a little more about uh, yourself and your background and kind of your professional journey before joining uh, joining Bloomberg. Sure. Well, well I've been with uh, Bloomberg and Bloomberg Intelligence for uh, for nine years, but mm. before that, I was a uh, an Excel side analyst, uh, which just means I worked on Wall Street, mm. uh, covered freight transportation for a number of years. Um, before that. Um, I covered the industrial uh, sector more broadly, hmm. and um, I kind of fell into research. And before that, I was doing investment banking um, um, on Wall Street for a number of years, uh, about about seven years before getting into uh, the research game. So mm. I've been in research for about 15 years now, uh, and you know I didn't I didn't grow up wanting to become a freight transportation logistics <laughs> analyst. It's something I kind of stepped in, uh, but it's been uh, an extremely rewarding uh, career. Um, you know, I get to meet a lot of interesting people. Mm. Uh, you know, while a lot of people think it's a uh, uh, you know, an old industry. It's yeah. constantly changing. Um, and, you know, this is a great conference to highlight that because it's, you know, tech focus and you got a lot of CIOs here uh, and you get to see what, uh, what what people are doing, maybe not today and tomorrow, but maybe a couple years down the road. Yeah. So out of all those different roles, those different industries that, that make up your background, What's been the toughest to kind of, um, you know, dive into and research and read the tea leaves and, and, and share insights? What's been the most challenging? Well, actually, I do think that one of the hardest things to, to, to get your arms around is on the technology side. Mm. Because, you know, like I just mentioned, I come from an industrial background. Uh, I've been covering transportation. And when a trucking company or a railroad, they start talking about, you know, their software systems or their technologies, it's kind of a lot of pie in the sky. You can't mm. touch it. You can't feel mm. it. Right. Um, you know, they'll will tell you that oh it's going to be you know awesome sauce and help uh, with earnings and, and <laughs> margins, but it's really hard to, to to detect. But you know actually what I'm finding a lot of the companies that I cover they're opening the books a lot more and showing mm. people the technology because mm. I think now while technology was a tool. Um, technology is, is becoming a differentiator mm. where um, it's becoming a competitive advantage. You know, you have some of the technology first companies like uh, Uber Freight, right. Convoy right. coming on, uh, and, and some of the, uh, le- um, you know, older uh, uh, legacy companies are either, you know, reacting or mm. being proactive mm. in, 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 in dealing with those new competitors. Right. You know, I think a lot of the ones uh, that I cover, you know, like J.B. Hunt or XBO, they're well positioned, mm. um, you know, but, you know, it, it does put a 
risks uh, on the freight brokerage industry, kind of like the you know the older kind of type of business. You're in a uh, you know in a room with a phone and a Rolodex and maybe a pack of Marlboros, and, and that's <laughs> you're just dialing for dollars. Right. I mean, right. those days are, are are disappearing. Right. You know, as technology uh, moves to the forefront, and mm. more and more truckers get um, comfortable with using technology yes, with, yes. with smartphones. And and really, uh, our trucking professionals are, are fastly. Many of them are already technologists, right? And they're getting more and more. It's becoming a technologist role. Um, you mentioned Uber Freight and Convoy. We, we've been fortunate to have both of those or, uh, organizations on the show. And Convoy in particular, um, you know, there's, they've been in the news here lately as they mm-hmm. have had a few challenges related to um, pricing and, 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 and uh, well, a couple different things. But who doesn't have challenges these days right. in the transportation industry? Uh, but they are, they are, both of those organizations are such an innovative push in the bar. It seems like for both of those organizations, technology is, is table stakes. It's not even a competitive advantage. It's just how they do business. It's core to their DNA. Yeah, and you know those technology first type brokers that you mentioned. You know, um, you know they're trying to win share, but they're mm-hmm. not winning share necessarily just with technology. Mm-hmm. They're right. winning share with price. Mm-hmm. Right. So you know the big question is like, when do they pivot towards profitability? Uh, what is that? You know, um, concentration on winning share with price. What does that do to the overall market? What does that do to the profitability mm-hmm. of uh, people that are trying to earn a living? That's right. Because uh, if you know if you're a well funded uh, company like uh, Uber has got some cash to burn. Uh, or you know, well-funded private companies like Convoy that have cash to burn, um, they 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 can you know lose money to win share. Right. But you know, the big question is like, you know, can you at turn some the, point? Can you turn the tanker around? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. At some point, you've got to get get on that profitability profitability yeah. train. Yeah. Money matters. Yeah. 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 Turns out. Yeah. If you're in yeah. business, you kind of want to turn a profit. <laughs> Coming from an expert. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I understand that. Uh, as it turns out, the public markets they actually demand that technology companies make money. I've I've heard that recently. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a new thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, when you look at, you know, I, I do not cover Uber as a company. Yeah. Uh, one of my colleagues at BI covers Uber, so he knows it uh, a lot better than I do. Um, but, y- y- you know, um, you know, you know, the investors have given them some leeway to kind of build a business. Right. But it's just, you know, and, and with Amazon, you saw that with Amazon, investors mm-hmm. gave them a, a lot of rope uh, to, to, for themselves to and flexibility to build a business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in some quarters, it's extremely profitable. In some quarters, it's not. Mm, right. And a lot of the, the things that are weighing on their profitability falls into our wheelhouse, mm. transportation. Right. Mm. Right. You know, speaking of innovative companies, uh, Rody uh, just announced a deal with Delta Air Cargo uh, where they're going to be, you know, Rody has been, they've got this, um, oh, by the way, where you take this type of business model, right, wherever you're going. Uh, well, they've just partnered with Delta Air Cargo to uh, it, 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 borrow space in the belly of these aircraft, which right. is going to be exciting. I think they're expanding. It's going to add a number of new markets and same-day service, which is fascinating. In fact, Greg and I were kidding as we drove our Ford Transit van from Atlanta to Austin, shipping all of our, our stuff for our mobile studio. We should have checked that road to see if there's anything else we could have loaded. We in had the room. <laughs> yeah. We had cube. That's yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so, um, before, so before next time we talk, that's right. Before we uh, dive more into your observations related to the transit transportation market and, and the greater Indian supply chain market. Um, where do you live? I live in New Jersey, New Jersey, outside of Manhattan. And what do you, when you're not involved neck deep in, in an industry that changes by the minute, it seems, what do you enjoy doing outside of work? Uh, I have a, uh, a 10 year old, uh, daughter and an eight year old son. So, uh, Ethan and Emerson, they keep me busy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my, and we, we just got a dog and I'm not a dog person. So are you a cat person? I, I'm not, I'm just not, not an, I'm animal, not an person. animal person. Okay. You know, after dirty diapers, I was kind of done <laughs> yeah. with that. Um, and, and so, um, you know, it, it's, it, that's been the biggest, uh, challenge in, in, in my life in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, okay. Do you what kind of dog? Are you, are you gonna promise not to laugh. I promise. An Australian Labradoodle. Oh, I've okay. heard of these. Yes. It's so a, this is a newer breed, not as curly. <laughs> no, seriously, we were having this discussion yeah. with one of my neighbors who yeah. has or is getting one. Yeah, they don't shed. They're hyperallergenic. Right. You know, this right. one uh, you can get minis. This one's going to get up to like thirty-five pounds. It's not a mini. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a. They're smart because they have the lab in them, and, yeah. and you know, so it's. it's <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's my dog. You know. That's cool. He's he's the prettiest boy dog I've ever seen. Well, uh, you know, at least it's not a you know a purse puppy, no. right? Mm. Yeah, so mm. that's good. Maybe that's down the road. Yes. 
Uh, okay, so moving from labradoodles to hard-hitting insights and observations from, especially the transportation. Obviously, transportation logistics is where you spend a lot of your time. What's been, you know, when you look back at 2019 as we're here in November and we're moving into fast and furiously moving into uh, end of year wrap up, what's been some of the most compelling observations or key takeaways for you this well, year? Well, there's two stories here, right? It depends if you're a, a capacity provider and it depends <laughs> if you're a shipper. Yeah. If you're a shipper, it's it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're a capacity provider, things are horrible. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but that's actually good news because sentiment is so low. Things are kind of seem to be bottoming. And, you know, we believe, you know, 2020, you know, it's not going to be uh, a 2000, uh, a, a second half 2017, you know, through 2018 story, mm. like really gangbusters. But it's going to be a, a better year uh, than 2019. At least mm. that's what our tea leaves say. Um, you know, and you're seeing that in, um, you know, stock performances. So stocks tend to kind of lead the industry because mm-hmm. people invest in stocks for what's mm. going to happen six, mm. uh, six months to 12 months out. Uh, you know, the LTL industry. Uh, you know, our peer group is up uh, for that. For uh, they're up 39 percent this year. Rails are up 32 percent. Mm. Truckload is up fourteen uh, percent, and couriers, which is pretty much FedEx, UPS, and uh, Deutsche Post, uh, it's uh, just. Uh, kind of limping along at up 2%, and that's uh, versus the broader market of, of 23%. So, you know, rails and LTL are outperforming the broader market, and TLs are still s- struggling, mm. um, you know, and, and that's really based on, um, you know, weak kind of pricing that we've been seeing in the spot markets. Mm. And that's been bleeding into the, the contractual markets. You know, mm. we saw uh, in, in August and September, uh, rates were down, um, you know, a low single digits mm. uh, on the contractual um, on the contractual basis, and that followed about... Uh, 28 months of increases, mm. um, you know, but we do still think that, you know, you could squeak out uh, in 2019, a, a, a slight increase right now, we're, I think we're, tra- we're, we're, we're about 2% up for the year. And, you know, we only have a couple more months left. So I think hmm. we can, you know, maybe squeak out something a little positive um, on the contractual side. And on, and on the LTL side, you know, pricing's pretty good. I mean, it's a more a consolidated market. Mm. It's more rational. Uh, no one's really fighting for share. Uh, people are actually looking at freight and just wondering if it, from a profitability standpoint, does it fit in their their uh, their network? They're willing to walk away from business mm. that doesn't have a certain, you know, return on investment or ROI. Wow, that's a good place to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, rates are up uh, mid-single digits. So that's, yeah. that's good. Yeah. So, uh, before we talk 2020, I think one of the other trends it seems like that we've been seeing a lot, especially in the last couple of years, is just the amount of investment coming into the logistics tech, freight tech, supply chain tech space. What do you make of that? And are we going to continue to see that in the next few years, do you think? Well, it's really being driven by e-commerce. You know, you have a lot of um, you know companies uh, like Prologix or uh, BlackRock. You know, mm-hmm. these these huge financial companies, or uh, you know, mm-hmm. buying up warehousing. You know, to right. kind of support uh, e-commerce. You know, e-commerce is is going is supposed to grow four to five times GDP. You know, obviously that's on a global basis, and that's going to be driven mostly out of Asia Pacific. But in the U.S., you're expected two to three times uh, above the, the overall economy. So, so I mean, people are just trying to take advantage of that. And, you know, as you know, we were talking about truckers, you mm-hmm. know, truckers have cell phones and these cell phones are not the, the phones that, you know, you and I had right. when we were a little younger. Uh, these are, you know, supercomputers mm-hmm. and yeah. you can do a lot. And, and, you know, people are becoming more productive. People are making better decisions. You have a guy that owns a 10 year old truck is able to use the, the algorithms from uh, a JB Hunt 360 system and figure out what is the best load for that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, not only for that person for that day, but what, you know, I want to like, you know, eventually I got to get back to, to Minnesota to see my, you know, kids football game. Um, you know, the next three loads has got to get me there. Yeah. Um, so there's just a, a, a lot of stuff uh, on the technology side. And, you know, it's just the technology keeps on growing and growing. You know, you have some stuff that's, in my view, uh, way off, like drones mm-hmm. and autonomous trucking. But then you also have things that are uh, that are here today, like the algorithms that I'm talking about, that it can make a, a broker more productive or a trucker more productive mm-hmm. or a warehouse dock. Uh, um, you know, um, person more productive, whether that's a robot, whether it's a handheld at a less than truckload facility. There's just a lot of things. Mm-hmm. You know, we got to um, uh, do a virtual tour with uh, with XPO uh, on one of their facilities. And, you know, what they're doing with robots and automation for mm-hmm. some of their customers is, is, is pretty impressive. And, mm-hmm. you know, you're cutting the humans out 
you still need humans, but you're cutting, you know, warehouse workers, um, you know, and you're bringing in more technologists. Uh, and, you know, you're also increasing the productivity and increasing the safety at the same time. Right. Um, it's pretty it's, it's pretty compelling stuff yeah. that's going on. And, 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 you know, speaking of bots, it's still providing opportunities for the workforce to do new things and do, and do more advanced things uh, and, and, to, and, and to make more money. Some of the stories we, we've uh, featured in Atlanta, and we talk a lot about the industrial distributor that brought on a, a highly automated system in, in its uh, large D.C. In, in West Atlanta. And not only did no one lose a job, all the maintenance techs that were part of the team that keep the facility going, all of them received new training. Mm -hmm. So now they could program bots and they made more. They're making more money. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I would point out also, like, you know, I don't think this is a place where you're taking people out of the workforce. You know, usually typically like a warehousing or uh, it's a high turnover business. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you're all, you're you're protecting yourself from that as well yeah. and, and having better reliability, better customer service as a result. Agreed. You know, the other interesting development that we've been reading and, and reporting on from a bot standpoint is, is just how many more companies are using a robots as a service approach, especially especially for peak season. So rather than investing in, in buying outright these bots, they're basically leasing them, especially to get through peak. Have you seen more of that or about the same or any? any yeah, you, you don't have to own the equipment. I mean, you can lease and flex up. Obviously, when you're, when you're flexing up in peak season, you're, you're going to be spending more money per bot per mm -hmm. month or whatever the, the, the price uh, you have with, with your distributor. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting time. I mean, mm -hmm. instead of, uh, you know, having to interview thousands and thousands of college, college right. kids, uh, right. you know, you can just, uh, just call up your, uh, your, your provider of, of robots and bots and then they can, you know, ship you 10 more R2-D2s or whatever that's they're going to yeah. call them. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's right. Right. Okay. D2-D2s. <laughs> that's right. Distributor to distributor. There you go. <laughs> so before we switch over to 2020, anything else that you've really, you know, looking back at 2019 thus far, um, anything else that really stands out related? Uh, I mean, it's re it's really macro. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're living in an environment where things can change, at least from my perspective, uh, from a tweet. Uh, you know, we have trade wars. You have increased protectionism. You mm -hmm. have Germany falling into a, you know, possibly falling into a recession. Mm -hmm. uh, you have U.S. and China growth slowing. Uh, you have GDP expectations that are continuing to be revised lower for 2019 and 2020. Uh, all these things are not good for business. Mm -hmm. They're not good for people um, that are going to invest capital for a little long term because there's extreme uncertainty. Right. Um, you know, you, you can markets eat, hate uncertainty. Yeah, they certainly do. And uh, and so, you know, I think that is the, the biggest problem because that really has driven everything else within the freight transportation sphere. I mean, I, I cover, you know, railroads, truckers, mm. uh, marine shipping, you know, mm. and that includes tanker, dry bulk, liner. I, 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 I cover it all. Um, for the most part, and um, you know, and it, every market is being impacted by this, mm -hmm. by this, this, these trade tensions. You know, obviously, the um, the the final outcome um, is. I think we all can agree that you know we want to all be on the same uh, playing field, uh, but it's been very disruptive to businesses. Uh, I'm not going to argue on on the policies of of what you know administration decides is to do versus another, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's been disruptive. Uh, it's created lumpy volumes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because a lot of a lot, we saw a lot of volume get pushed forward in the fourth quarter of 2018, and we're coming up against those tough comps. Mm. And so now we have high inventory levels in the U.S., uh, at least higher than the normal, uh, plus the difficult comp. So uh, right. optically, it's not going to look great when you see volumes. And you know, we've seen volumes you know, start. Um, to decelerate, whether we're talking about railroads, commodity carloads, mm. railroad intermodal carloads. Um, and so, you know, we're, we expect uh, 2019 to be down for the rail industry. You know, we haven't seen that since 2015, mm. Mm. Um, you know, because the first three quarters were, were negative. Mm. You know, we, we've, we've also been reading about the precision scheduled railroading, the PSR, and and some of the challenges in, um, in, in in growing through some of those initiatives. Any any comments there? Yeah, I mean PSR, uh, you know, um, is really you know for anyone that's investing in rails is on the tip of everyone's tongue. How low can you get that RO? 
R O R R O R operating ratio. Um, a little dyslexic in my head right now. Um, but you know, it's all about how you can get that lower. And you know, Precision Scheduling Railroad really worked for the Canadian Rails. It worked for CN and CP. Mm. It's working for CSX. Now we have three new uh, U.S. rails that are trying it. One with some uh, Mexican exposure uh, with uh, with Kansas City Southern and uh, Union Pacific and Norfolk Southern. Mm. And you know, the reality is is that we're not going to really know the true benefit because they're doing this in a time where volumes are down. When volumes are down, right. your variable your costs go down. Um, you have less congestion on mm -hmm. your network. So it's so we really don't know what the true benefits are for those railroads. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, their results in the third quarter were a little disappointing. Um, you know, most uh, rails improved their operating ratio by about 150 basis points in the third quarter versus mm. the year prior. Uh, but UNP and, and, and NS kind of disappointed in, in, in the mm. pace of the productivity. You know, we, we believe longer term that, you know, it's, it's going um, to... way to go. Yeah. You know, it's going to bear fruit and it's going to really provide uh, for the next level of a railroad that we're seeing at Canadian National and Canadian Pacific. They're, they're more pivoting towards growth. You know, yeah. they're profitable mm -hmm. growth. They're, mm -hmm. they're not... Op, uh, myopically focused on their serving everybody. Well, yeah, and then their yeah. margins too. Right. So you know uh, they're willing to take on business that's only thirty five percent, you mm. know, EBIT margin, mm. uh, which is pretty high for an industrial company. Yeah. You know, we were reading. We were reading where one of the CEOs of one of the lines you mentioned was addressing, especially when they launched their PSR initiative, at least publicly. They were talking about how they were also going to have to uh, choose smart business more effectively, and and they couldn't serve everybody. Uh, and keep 100% of their, their current customers because of some of these these changes, some of these hard, harder looks they're looking at the business. So i uh, really curious to see kind of that path ahead and, and how things continue to ripple out as PSR might revolutionize industry in many ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the perfect example is, is CSX. I mean, they, you know, maybe didn't implement PSR with their customers in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. And I think the the the, 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 the NS's, UPs, and, and, and Kansas City Southerns have learned from uh, the mistakes that CSX made. Uh, but what CSX did is they, you know, instead of focusing on a hub and spoke intermodal network, they wanted to focus on three main um, uh, lanes, which is kind of like a triangle mm. uh, on their network, mm. and kind of build density on those lanes and kind of, you know, everything else they, they kind of walked away from. Mm. Um, you know, my guess is uh, the that next year, we'll probably see them pivot towards maybe mm. trying to grow that business versus trying to contract that business. Um, you know, and, and I think over time, you know, you might see them go back into some of the markets that they left. But when I say over time, I mean like, you know, three years from now. Because, right. yeah. you know, they need to grow. And, you know, they can only grow as much as what's on their network mm. um, that they have access to. Yep. So speaking of next year, that's a perfect segue opportunity, uh, looking at 2020, uh, or in, not just 2020, looking at just kind of the short-term outlook. Um, break out your crystal ball, Lee, uh, and tell us some of the things you're expecting to happen. Okay. Um, well, like, like I said earlier, you know, I think that... Um you know, I think we're going to see a bottoming of the spot truckload market. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, maybe by uh, the summertime, you could start seeing rates start increasing again. Um, yeah, that's going to be, you know, driven not necessarily on the demand side, but more on the supply side. You know, a lot of guys and gals got into the business when rates were pretty high in, in, in the first half of 2018. So they leased trucks. They they did all these things for a certain business model for rates that were, you know, 20 percent higher than right. they are today. And it doesn't make sense now. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're going to see those people say, you know, it's not necessarily going to be a bankruptcy. They could just be like, you know something, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to park my truck or maybe re return the lease or, you know, or, or just maybe go into bankruptcy. Mm. Uh, so you're going to see, uh, you know, players come out of the market. Um, you know, I think as more and more trucking companies implement uh, hair follicle drug testing, mm. uh, that's going to reduce the pool of um, qualified drivers. And also, um, you've seen a huge increase in insurance. You know, um, you know, Werner uh, had a huge judgment against it. You know, uh, yes. they, I don't remember the exact number, but it was something like forty million dollars, which was, you know, huge uh, and a tragic accident. Um, you know, that that happened with one of their drivers. Um, but you know, you're seeing insurance companies leave the market because all of a sudden you're seeing plaintiff lawyers, you know, kind of salivate a little bit mm -hmm. where they say, oh, you know, we can get into this trucking. You know, we can start suing truckers. Uh, because some of them have deep pockets. Right. Uh, and so insurance costs are going up significantly. And, you know, if insurance is too expensive, that's going to push other some smaller drivers out of the market. Because mm. a lot of the large 
companies are self-insured over a certain to a certain extent, right. and then they buy insurance for anything over that. The little guy or gal, you know, they're, they're buying it on the open market, and it's it's it, you know they don't have the pricing power at all uh, to, to 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 benefit it. So I think supply is going to come out of the market. That's mm-hmm. going to increase rates. It should generate uh, posit- positive contract rates in the very low single digits. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that you know you could see a rebound of intermodal uh, on the commodity side for for rails. Uh, there's really no shining star that like oh let's hang our hat on you know when i first started covering the industry it was uh uh it was ethanol uh you know it was the big growth driver uh you know now really the only good thing going is crude by rail um and and, you know but that doesn't benefit everybody Mm. uh just a a couple of the rails so you know crude by rail could be good good uh which would mitigate the weakness that we're seeing in Mm. in at least utility coal Mm. Mm. um all right, so today you're um, you've got a breakout session. I do, uh, and, and I think you had a, a session or a keynote uh, when we were in Atlanta last yep. June as well. Yep. Um, everyone's vying for your insights. I'm yep. glad we we're we're having you know having you a couple times here on Splash Now Radio. Um, so, what are you going to be talking about as part of that breakout? Yeah, so I'm just going to be you know hitting a lot of the points that we hit here today. You know, kind of our outlook. You know, where we've been on, uh, in in freight transportation. Uh, kind of weigh it a little heavier on the trucking market, uh, but you know where we've been and where we think we're going. Um, you know, like I said, you know the good news is uh, sentiment is horrible. Uh, at least if yeah. you're you know an investor in, in, in a transportation uh, company or if you're operating a transportation company. You know, for shippers, they should expect you know you know rates. Uh, not to be as low as they are this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen, you know, over uh, the last cycle, a lot of shippers kind of embracing uh, their capacity providers mm. uh, within more of a cooperative standpoint, um, you know, moving spot business to contractual business and moving contractual business to dedicated business. And, and, and that's also one of the reasons why the spot market is kind of weak. You've mm. seen, you know, um, loads that traditionally went into the spot market go into the contractual market because like you know if you're you know uh, you're in charge of purchase transportation you can't go into your cfo's office every year and say you know my costs you know went up 20 percent more than what i thought you know you want some uh consistency and and being the contractual market mm. provides you that level of consistency yeah so you know that's that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on um you know, hopefully people show up and listen. Uh, I hate talking to myself. I do it a lot. <laughs> I doubt you do much of that. <laughs> this is, you know, um, I bet it'll be filled from from wall to wall. I mean, I think folks are craving what we've seen. It's a small room. It is. <laughs> well, that'll make it easier to fill. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What we have seen is, you know, leaders are craving these insights. They're, they're craving folks that are willing to read the tea leaves and and, and assert, you know, give an opinion. You know, give a uh, give a what's going to happen, not a not a lot of uh, uh, couching or uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, w- walking the line, the way that they're looking for folks are willing to you know look at the data, look at you know read the market, and then offer up opinions about where we're going or, or, or whether it's around the corner or a couple years down the road. One of the topic I want to pick your brain on, Lee, um, is IMO 2020. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you how, how deep you you, know, you are knee in deep. that knee deep. Okay, yeah. good. Well, any uh, you know, that's going to be a huge challenge, and uh, which is maybe saying the least. But I think a lot of folks may not realize that it's not just about the technology and not just about the changeover to what's next. It's also a big supply chain challenge because sure. w- whatever it moves to. You've got to have that readily available at ports globally. So, any quick hitting observations on on that? Yeah, the, the the reality with IMO 2020 uh, is that you know the price for diesel fuel will probably spike in the first quarter. Mm. Uh, it'll probably find some normalization uh, late in the second quarter. Uh, at least that's our guesstimate. Um, so I'm not promising anything. Uh, and, you know, and, and that is going to be because, you know, while we think that the supply chain is well suited right now, there is going to be a learning curve um, in terms of availability. You know, there are some sub segments of the, the marine shipping industry that are like, um, you know, all in with scrubbers and they're just going to use the dirty fuel and try to clean it. And then, you know, that's kind of more the uh, the, the dry bulk industry or, or tanker industry where the liner industry, like only 10% of their fleets are going to be using scrubbers. So they're going to need um, the, the clean fuel. And not every one of these container liners go into the port of LA or, mm-hmm. or you know, uh, Hong Kong or, or Singapore, one of these major ports. You know, there 
they're also doing a lot of intra stuff. So it, the availability is, is, is definitely key. Um, so the, the, the knockoff effect, like I said, higher diesel prices here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, for truckers and for railroads and, and everyone involved. You know, the good news for, you know, those companies is that they have fuel surcharges uh, implemented that kind of mitigate uh, not all, mm -hmm. but some of uh, those increases. So hopefully it won't bite into margins too badly. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely going to be a headwind in, in, in the first half of next year. Um, but like I said, I think that, um, you know, A, it's a good move because, you know, if, if marine shipping was a country, it would be the sixth or seventh largest wow. polluter. Right. Uh, mm. of carbon emissions. Mm. So, you know, mm. it's a dirty industry. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the fuel that they use is just really the, the sludge left over of refining. Mm. And it's just, it's just, it's, it's good that they're getting away mm. from it. Outstanding. Okay. So let's talk about, as we kind of wrap up this segment with Lee Klaskow, uh, with Bloomberg Intelligence. Let's talk about the next big show on your radar. I hear you're going to be up in Chicago soon. I am. Next week, I'm going to be at uh, Freight Waves. At, uh, it's my first Freight Waves con uh, concert, uh, conference. Uh, <laughs> Maybe there will be a concert. Maybe. You know, I'm doing a wave talk, uh, yeah. so, and that's kind of like a, nice. their version of a TED Talk. So nice. uh, like a lot of pacing, a lot of hand gesturing. You have to wave. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. But I'm looking forward to that. Uh, they, they've been uh, nice enough to, to have me. Good you know, last uh, or, or two weeks ago, I did uh, JOC's Inland Conference, and before that, I did uh, Capital. Capital Links uh, Marine Shipping Conference. So, mm. um, you know, I've been on the on the road a little bit, and you know, I'm kind of active on LinkedIn. So, if people want to reach out to me, uh, they can. Uh, my last name is K L A S K O W, first name Lee L E E. And uh, you know, I, I talk to I you know I'll, I'll correspond pretty much to anyone. I'm, I'm a lonely person. <laughs> um, you know, I you got a dog now. You're not quite yeah, you're not, well. yeah. <laughs> And um, so yeah, so you know whether you're a, a capacity provider, someone working for a large company, you know, a shipper, um, you know, an owner operator. I just I just love hearing from people because that's the great thing about doing research. You learn every day. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm in my ivory tower. Um, and so, you know, I'm not actually, you know, behind the wheel or, you know, in a, in a rail yard or, or work in a ship. But, you know, it, it's talking to, to people in the industry that, that makes me smarter and helps mm -hmm. my research, uh, you know, have more insight for uh, for our customers at Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, we sure do enjoy it. I mean, uh, clearly, uh, you're someone that not just does our homework, but you you know it. You're, you're, you're well connected. Um, I feel like I can ask you just about anything related to the world of internet supply chain, and I'm going to get a, a, an informed answer. So I appreciate you spending some time here with us uh, My here pleasure, today. Scott. Okay, so uh, listeners, you already heard kind of how to connect with Lee. He is active on social media, especially LinkedIn, and I'm sure he'd, he'd love to hear from you. Check out his um, uh, articles and, and perspectives at Bloomberg Intelligence, right? Yeah, so so Bloomberg, the Bloomberg Terminal is a subscription-only uh, service. Uh, we have about 330,000 subscribers globally. Most of those subscribers are, are decision makers uh, from the C-suite to, you know, floor traders. Uh, and, you know, what uh, we do at Bloomberg Intelligence, which is Bloomberg's research arm, is we provide uh, kind of insight and uh uh, on our industries that we cover. Uh, we have about 280 analysts globally. We cover about 180 sectors, I think, now, and about mm. 2,000 companies. Mm. Um, and, you know, we cover it from an equity standpoint, a credit standpoint, a regulatory standpoint, economic standpoint. So it's a great resource. Um, you know, it, our research goes uh, exclusively on that. And then you'll also see some of our stuff, whether we're quoted or, um, you know, they put it on our, uh, the Bloomberg.com website. And you might see uh, some of my colleagues on TV and radio, um, you know, uh, talking about uh, the industries that they cover. Mm. Outstanding. Uh, okay, so I've got two final hard-hitting questions, actually, for both of y'all to wrap up this segment. Uh, so break out your sports crystal ball. Who's going to win the NFL Super Bowl this season? And Greg, why don't you go first? Patriots. The Patriots. It hurts on. me to say it. I thought for sure we hear the Chiefs. It hurts me to say it. Their okay. defense is just way too strong. Okay, fair yeah. enough. I mean, Lee, what you think? I, I, I might say San Fran. <laughs> San Fran? Yeah. I'm a Giant fan, and, and they're horrible. <laughs> well, we're Falcons fans yeah. and not maybe the worst yeah. season thus far yeah. uh, in the NFL. So we've got one Niners, and we've got the, the Patriots. Please don't say it easy. again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, well, I don't think it's easy. I mean, this year, look, I mean, the Chiefs are going to come back because mm. Mahomes will be back this week. Mm. Um. And they played well with Matt Moore, who to thunk it, a yeah. high school high school uh, assistant coach turned NFL quarterback. That guy is going to get a check. Love those stories. In the NFL, by the way. Um, but 
Yeah, uh, it, they're just too good. I mean, and this is probably Brady's last season. Mm. So, all right. So, second question: uh, College, college football. Who's going to win it all? So, so, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about college, but I'm gonna take a couple steps back into Division Three. Okay. So, in two weeks the Cortica Jug Bowl is going on. That's between Ithaca and Cortland. I okay. went to Ithaca College. Okay. Oh. So they're gonna playing at MetLife. They're expected. What? Uh, yeah. They're the, playing at MetLife. Yeah. So like all of uh, my, you know, I've been out of college for quite some time. Where it's it's a great. Uh, opportunity to to get together with some old friends, and you know I'm going to be pulling for Ithaca. So for the Cortica jug, that that's it all, and it's uh, I'm pulling for Ithaca. So tell our listeners the history of the jug. Uh, I don't really know how far back it goes, but literally it was a, it was a college game where the winner would get a jug in their in the col- in the, the college name on it. So right. I think they're up to their third jug. Yeah. It's like this ceramic pottery thing, uh, and it's a rivalry. You know, it yeah. goes, uh, you know it's a Division three school, but they've uh, they've had yeah. decent sports programs there. For so their kids three. are really really smart. They're the mm. future head coaches in the <laughs> NFL. So okay, Greg. So you've got to weigh in and, and pick. You can do D three, D two, D one, whatever. What's your t- what's your take? NF, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, football. Yes, college football. I I don't care how you rank them. I still think Clemson is the best yeah. foot team in the in the NCAA. Love it, love it. Okay, so, that is a high note that we'll wrap I, up. And on. I'm not a fan, by okay. the way. Yeah, <laughs> not a fan. And it's not it's yeah. not because he is a fan. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, look, I I think you know Bama is is vulnerable without mm. Tua, mm. right? And um, George is a pretender. Hurts me to say that. Mm. Also. Mm. Um, and Ohio State, I hate them. Um, I'm a Michigan fan, so I can't pull for them. I love Justin Fields. He went to high school with my daughters, but mm, Georgia, uh, and he's yeah. he is undoubtedly the best quarterback in NCAA mm. football right mm. now. But um, and they are a well-rounded team. But mm. I just don't think you can stop Dabo Sweeney from grabbing that grabbing that glass. Love that, Bo. Well, on that note, uh, again, big thanks to our guests here today for this segment, Lee Klaskow with Bloomberg Intelligence. Be sure to check him out across social media. You will enjoy it as much as we did, uh, I'm sure. Uh, to our listeners, stay tuned as we continue our coverage of the EFT Logistics CIO Forum a Reuters event right here in Austin, Texas. And be sure to check out all of our upcoming events, replays of our interviews, other resources at SupplyChainNowRadio.com. Greg, we may have just published a little uh, milestone episode number 200 this yes, week. Yes, congratulations. We and I tell you, that, that may not mean anything to anyone else, but we know all the blood, sweat, and tears that went into you each of what? those conversations. It, it made number 201, the posting of number 201, even that much more rewarding right. because that was a really special episode as well. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and check out all the, the library of episodes. I was going to say, what number Go is this? This will. <laughs> wow, that we is don't a know that yet. Oh, we don't know so yet. We don't know. Okay. Yet. Right? It depends on the order in which it's published, but it'll be. I'm going to take in a stab the tw- at it. In the 220s, too? Right. I'm going to say 222. Well, you can make that happen. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it happen. That's Let's right. make this one 220. That's right. 220, 222, like, whatever yeah. it takes. That's, that's like right. three weeks. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I, I'm sure always share some futures markets on podcast numbers. We Don't might feed get chili great. to a baby. There we go. <laughs> well, hey, uh, listeners, check us out at SupplyChainRadio.com. Again, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcast from. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. On behalf of our entire team, Scott Luton here wishing you a wonderful week ahead, and we will see you next time on Supply Chain Radio. Thanks, everybody. Go Blue.